Stigma Talks. One in four of us will be affected by mental illness. Presenting Stigma Talks, the online talk show in association with Stigma One in Four. Stigma Talks. Hi, my name is Jessica, and you're watching Stigma Talks. I'm here with Paul Trivitz, who's a film producer. I'm Paul Trivitz, and I support Stigma One in Four. Well, thank you for joining us. When you're do- taking on the subject like Jane Eyre, and you're thinking I've got to give something new, what was the general kind of strategy, or um, did he have any ideas in mind about how to distinguish Jane Eyre from? But it may be that if you go back yeah. to the last time Jane Eyre was made on the film, it was made I think in 1996 by Franco Zeffirelli. His adaptation is not necessarily particularly faithful to the book, so yeah. we did go back much more to there's an Orson Welles version I think it was made in 1947 and our story is much more faithful to the book mm-hmm. so our story does really go back to the two core things about this young woman who comes and enters this big house and there is a secret in that house there is something that is happening that you don't quite know now One could imagine there is another version of Jane Eyre that you could tell. You could probably turn it into, uh, if you remember film The Others, you could really turn Jane Eyre into a ghost story that the woman that Rochester is married to somehow roams around upstairs in the house and that the young girl is maybe seeing things and you think she's... I mean, you could... We didn't do that. Which adaptations do you think have worked where the film has been better than the book? Can you think of any... That jump to mind where they've done something. I think really Schindler's List is one of the most. Ext- I, I think is an extraordinary adaptation. Just something that just jumps to yeah. mind where I go. The power of that movie, in addition to the power of that book, yeah. I think The English Patient is extraordinary. I mean, really amazingly. Book the book is different, by the way. That's the other thing I think is if you try to capture and copy what's in the book, that yeah. doesn't necessarily work. Which is why, by the way, adaptations is a relatively small part of the storytelling in cinema. So so cinema does have something that is unique, and I think in part it has to do with the format. It is quite interesting that you can tell a story that feels whole and big and wonderful, but only really lasts 90 minutes. How many books do you read, even if you read fast? that you can read from beginning to end in 90 minutes and you feel you've had a full meal. So you've had a starter, a main course, and a dessert, and you walk away satisfied. Very rare, those are normally novellas. So there is something about the book. And again, you have to think about the origin of the book. Think about Dickens. Dickens didn't write his books as books. They came out as, in a feuilleton in weekly installments. And every week people, that's a bit like a TV series. It's like a soap. Every week a bit came out and you follow the characters. Do you think the film then is more similar to the short story in that you do it probably, in one reading, one sitting? Probably, but, but, but it can't yeah. be a short story because you can't short, sorry, that sounds like a sort of yeah. pun in the way. You can't short change people. People want to have wonderful characters, quickly established, three-dimensionally developed. They want a beginning, a middle, and an end, and they want a resolution. I understand that you were head of the new cinema fund at yes. the UK Council. When you're sifting through all these screenplays um, of young aspiring writers, what do you look for? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because I did that for six years, um, from 2000 to 2006. Um, when I took that job, I didn't come from a world of doing that. I was a relatively unusual choice, being a, having been an independent producer, to, to, to become sort of poacher turned gamekeeper, right, because I was sitting at the other side Mm. with a pot of lottery money. And I was quite scared in the beginning, scared partly about volume. I literally thought that on the day one, because it was a new organisation, we would have 500 screenplays lying on a pile and we had to go through them all. But this is the key things I learned. First of all, writing a good screenplay is really hard, like writing a good novel Mm. is really hard. So I'm afraid that nine out of every 10 screenplays we got just weren't very good. So I would say any of us, any of you who would have done my job quite quickly would have been able to separate out the things that weren't very good, Mm -hmm. where there were characters you didn't care about, a story that wasn't going anywhere, it wasn't telling anything, anybody. In which case, that's quite easy. We got, to give you an idea, three or 400 projects a year. So once you take away the 300, let's say 350, once you take away the 300 that really 
don't pass at a basic level, you're left with 50. And here's the second thing that happens. There are at least five, six, seven, eight scripts a year that are brilliant. And you would pick them out too. Okay? So when I read the screenplay for Bloody Sunday by Paul Greengrass, it was a brilliant screenplay. The hardest part of my job and the job of my team was to deal with the 20, 30, 40 projects that weren't in the reject pile and that weren't in the brilliant pile. It was in the middle. They were the ones that had interesting elements, weren't fully formed, needed more work, stuck in some way, shape or form. What were the worst film premises that you've read? Well, I can't tell you what the worst premises are, but part of my role was to work with, you know, aspiring young filmmakers, and we created a huge program around short okay. films and short f filmmaking. And we commissioned over a hundred short films a year, which is a lot, okay, across the country. Yeah. So I think in my five or six years, we commissioned 500 short films. And at some point, I remember that all the people that were doing this commissioning were saying, if we see one more script, about a little girl in a red dress and a balloon were going to throw up. Really? Yeah. There was literally, <laughs> every, every story started with a girl in a red dress, sorry, you're not quite wearing a red dress today, and a balloon. And it just somehow was like, I don't know what it was, and a dog. If you read screenplay of Die Hard, it sort of somehow, when they describe John McClane, I don't know, but I remember that you read it and you go, the way that they just get him. You just know, not just because you've seen the film, it just grabs you by the cojones. It completely <laughs> grabs you, totally. Have you ever made, or are you, do you consider making uh, foreign films, foreign language films, in terms well, of I'm reaching a Well, I'm Dutch yeah. by birth, uh, and I've worked on some Dutch films. Um, I, I did make a film in Icelandic okay. called Noi Albinoi. Absolutely. I mean, look, one of the advantages, one of the reasons why I came here uh, and, and went to film school here was that if you make films in the English language, you do have the advantage that that language, certainly in cinema terms, travels easier. And does that change the way that you tell a story? Do you ever think, I can't make this too British or in, entrenched in British humour? Is that ever important? It, it is, and there's a very good, interesting example. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm entirely answering your question, but for instance, one of the things that we don't have or haven't had very much in the UK is films about teenagers for teenager films. Okay. And often you'll see that major American teen movies, which largely sit around high schools, don't translate. So that's even more interesting. It's the same language, but it has a different set of, different framework, okay? Mm -hmm. Are comprehensives and American high schools, somehow that's not the same. And I think that there is often a problem is that if you write something, so in this case, in the same language, yeah. as somebody once said, America and the UK are two nations divided by a language. If you write something and you write something and it's set in America and, it's, and, you, and it says, you know, we're in a row, we're in a car and we drive up to, you know, a big city, it feels big. If you say we're on the M1 and we're driving into Milton Keynes, it is not cinematic. Whatever you do, that's not cinematic. And so there is an issue in a way with what our language, what our landscape looks like. Well, thank you very much. Um, those are all my questions, but uh, thank you very much for joining us and you've been watching Stigma Talks. Thank you.